Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Rebecca Mead and Hannah Rawson. Hello, everybody, and thanks for coming. Welcome to you all, uh, and welcome, Hannah. Thank you. Good um, morning, everyone. We're going to chat for a while, and then towards the end, I am going to open things up for questions. We've already received a request from one member of the public asking whether it's gonna, there are gonna be, there's going to be time for hostile questions. <laughs> and <laughs> Hannah said, yes, there is going to be time for hostile questions. So please have your questions ready. Um, and do not be afraid. She's used to it. I welcome uh, that. I welcome. <laughs> you can ask my husband. I welcome <laughs> hostile questions. Um, <laughs> so, so Hannah's Twitter bio reads, among other things, I wrote the book The End of Men, and yet they are still here. Uh, <laughs> um, and I was, I was emailing this morning with a colleague of mine at The New Yorker, a uh, brilliant young writer called Gia Tolentino, who's written a lot about women's issues right now. And I told her I was interviewing you. And she wrote back and said, God, I would love to know what it feels like to be a person who wrote a book with the title The End of Men <laughs> right now. So I, I'm asking, what does it feel like? <laughs> I have to say, at the time I wrote it, I was always a little shaky about it because I feel like it's a Rorschach test, you know? Some so men will look at it and say, oh, she's one of those bananas feminists and women will look at it and say like that's not true I'm oppressed at my job all the time how dare you say that so people would have diametrically opposite responses to the book which always left me in a slightly shaky place now I feel like I was so right like <laughs> what <laughs> it's like between the Trump election you know being essentially determined by aggrieved masculinity and sort of his general view on these things and then sexual harassment scandal where you wake up and it's like oh there's another one going down and another one going down and then I was like I wasn't I didn't mean it literally guys you don't <laughs> have to like take them all down at once but um, but right now it feels like it was truer than it felt when I actually wrote it for sure yeah. so you wrote in the book about the um, the way in which in the 2012 election, white men didn't get their candidate elected for the first time ever. Yeah. Um, was the election of Trump the revenge of those white men on their one defeat in ah. the history of the universe? <laughs> <laughs> well, I do think that, um, I mean, when I think about Trump, having grown up in New York, and you live in New York now, I grew up there, there are things about Trump that he presents in the public sphere that are obviously not true if you've known him through his political career, right? He doesn't care about gay rights. He doesn't care about abortion. He is not a cultural conservative, right? We've all watched him, I did throughout my youth, grow up in New York City. The one thing that has been true to his psyche and to his you know, series of marriages and to his public positions has been his understanding of gender dynamics. The way he talks about his wife, Ivana, if you read his her book, no, it's in his book, where he talks about how irritating it was when she started to get serious about work. I mean, it really grates at him. He doesn't like it. He doesn't believe that the relationships between men and women should be that way. Um, the way he, so he talks about Melania and their particular relationship, and, and the way he talks in public, you know how you are reading signals of politicians, like with George W. Bush, if you read between the lines, you could see that he was talking about to evangelicals without him exactly saying he was talking to evangelicals. There's a lot of what Trump says where between the lines you can see that he's, sometimes it's like, not between the lines, because it's like, look at the size of my hand. So he's not the most <laughs> subtle person in the world. But sometimes even between the lines, you can see that he's speaking to a group of sort of aggrieved men. And by the way, a lot of this was a, a kind of movement that happened on the internet. This wasn't entirely, like there's one element of it, which I wrote about in the book, which is kind of the men out of work and the shifts in the economy, which left working class men kind of at loose ends, but there's another element of it which was not in the book because it was not apparent until later, which is you know the this sort of this sort of just wave of internet revolt of of white men against uh, what they essentially considered. I'm trying. I only I speak 
in vulgarities in my mind. I can't Girl, can speak what, them. You can't do that here? The pussification of society. Yes. <laughs> just society becoming <laughs> like wimpified That's and not PC. Vulgar, by the way. And <laughs> just kind of, and it, and it was just kind of a revolt against that in lots of different ways. So there was a kind of world work society version and a kind of online version, which I think really helped to get him elected. And speaking of the pussification of society, <laughs> of, of, of vulgarity, I will repeat infinitely. Yes. Um, we had Hillary Clinton, who was the personification of the pussification. In a way, In a way it worked or was out she not? perfectly for him. For him, right? <laughs> because the thing that the, the kind of gestalt spirit that this internet movement cannot stand is the kind of um, school marmish, you know, all the stereotypes about Hillary, the kind of, I'm scolding you, I'm doing things correctly, I have my eyes on you, I see when you're doing things wrong, I, I'm, you know, that, that sort of stereotype about the kind of mommy constantly on you, making sure you're doing things correctly, and um, so I think, so, so I think the kind of, the, the showdown was set up perfectly. Uh, between the two of them for him to kind of ride the wave and tap into all this, you know, partly uh, cultural annoyance and partly kind of real economic uh, dislocation and discontent. Strangely enough, the school mom thing, if you're British and you're Margaret Thatcher, works really well. Well, and <laughs> everybody wants it. So that's one big difference between us. I do think guys. about that. Like when I think about, you know, how we will one day have a, a woman president, there are moments when nations just kind of back into position where they're begging for the mommy. And there are other moments <laughs> <laughs> when they're just get away from me. So I think it's like, and this is not just in the Western world. There's African, you know, Rwanda after it's, war just decided like <laughs> we, we need a mother figure to, for, for sort of healing and sanity and putting us back together. There's lots of times in history where the kind of what we think of as traditionally feminine leadership styles are kind of people are hungering for them. So maybe we'll get our moment. Do you think that, I mean, if you're weighing the balance between um, Trump, th between Trump tapping into some kind of economic resentment on the part of men who'd lost positions that they used to have, versus um, tapping into a real resentment of the rise of women uh, correlative to that. Uh, do, you, do, you, do you weigh, do you, do, you, do you think one is more heavy than the other? I mean- You mean the female, the women's resentment against him? No, I mean the, the, the what you described as the pussification. I mean, those two grievances, which one was more important, do you think, in the the economic force or the, I think they... Or the, or the gender resentment. Wow, that's a good question. I think that the internet force is where the vitality is. Mm -hmm. And the economic force has a certain resignation to it. So it's almost like the resignation came first, and that's the phenomenon I describe in my book, where all of a sudden it became crystal clear after the 2009 recession that the industrial economy was never coming back. I mean, you could you could have known that for a while, but all of a sudden it's just crystal clear. If you look at the lists of jobs that are disappearing, they're all list jobs that are dominated by men. If you look at the future, it's all jobs that are dominated by women, and they're not necessarily excellent jobs. A lot of them are low-paying healthcare jobs. It's it's just that you could see, um, you could see the economic shift, and I think that led. And then marriages fell apart. I mean, rates of single, all sorts of things followed from the economic dislocation. But that would lead to a resignation. That wouldn't necessarily lead to a political revolt. I think you needed some kind of mischievous animus. I mean, if you look at the online movement, is very different than the economic movement. The online movement is like fun and mischievous and very naughty and very combative. I mean, that's the kind of energy you need to win an election. And I think that's once, you know, once it's spread from kind of corners of the libertarian Silicon Valley, Bitcoin-ish in internet into the mainstream of Facebook, and you know, once it became sort of available to everyone, because there's Breitbart, which has this sort of impish spirit, and all sorts of places where people could get information like that, and it was totally accessible if you were not sort of a nerdy guy sitting in your computer, then it became just kind of more widespread, and it's very fun, sorry to say. It's just like, if you live in that world, you're just having a good time, in the way you're not having a good time if you've just lost your job. Like, there's just something just kind of fun about that 4chan, like, screw all of you energy, which can really get people going. 
And what do you think Trump brought to that? Why did he become the perfect vessel for that? Well, um, okay, so I will confess something here. My family are all Trump voters. I'm the only exception. So I sort of, a lot of it is I like watch Trump through their eyes. And I think a lot of it is kind of, I, I often when I'm watching, um, not my, my family of origin are Trump voters, not my family like my husband. I was going to say, no, no, I didn't no, want to no, go no, there. No, but no, 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 not that family. My, my family of origin um, were all Trump voters. And uh, I would watch Trump through their eyes and I would think, they receive him like a character, like an Old Testament character, uh -huh. like a t character from the tort. Like his flaws, they just don't necessarily take them seriously. And he reads to them like, um, like a human being, you know, like, a, in like an idiot human being. And Both an Old Testament prophet and an idiot human yeah, being Yeah, Old at Testament the same time. prophets are idiot, idiot human, human beings. beings right? They're always, you know, they're doing stupid things and cheating on their wives and then stealing someone. You know, they're not, they're very, very flawed people. And he reads to them something like that. And he, um, like, I kind of get, I, I, in my, I got a very sinking feeling in my heart watching the debates when Hillary said the word fact check all the time. I was like, what, what, fact check? Like, <laughs> what is that as a rallying cry? <laughs> fact check things. It's just not a, it doesn't sound right. Like, pe people don't really talk like that. And so, so I, so I felt, I just, I felt about, I think that that is, you know, he just, there's something in the 4chan kind of, um, sort of like spirit of, of impish mischievousness that kind of makes it possible to vote for Trump, who's like screwing things up and saying the wrong things. And, you know, um, I, I don't know that it was noble. I just think it was fun. So, you know? I mean, your, your family's the Old Testament framing of Trump <laughs> may be very peculiar they to your- They didn't say that, by the way. No, I made that up. But, but I yeah. think it's fascinating. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, I don't know whether that, uh, that that, that kind of characterization of Trump necessarily translates to a, a very wide mm -hmm. swathe of his supporters. Perhaps it does. Um, I wonder what you make of the tremendous support among women for Trump. Wow, I don't have anything for that one. That's an interesting one, isn't it? Uh, sometimes I think about, I mean, there, I don't have anything but the obvious thoughts. There's like a nostalgia for old gender roles in conservative America, and that does come from a real place. That comes from the place of like families being destroyed. So like conservative America and red state America is a place where marriages are not holding together and where they have the wild, wildly highest rates of single motherhood. Um, you know, there is a sense in which, like you know how you always hear 50% of marriages end in divorce. That's not actually true. It's totally class bifurcated. Uh, upper class, by which I mean college educated marriages, are uh, extremely stable and historically very happy. Um, you know, they measure these things and, and sort of like rates of contentment with I among college educated married people are at their highest ever. Uh, now, one theory about that is because the gender roles are more fluid. You know, you can sometimes the man holds the water, sometimes the woman, like the Obamas, they have what I call in my book a seesaw marriage. You know, at one point Michelle was making the money and Barack was working in law school and then Barack was, you know, they, it's like a switch places and nobody's locked into a role and there's just a lot more freedom in the upper class marriages. Working class marriages are uh, like really going in the tank at this point. They're sort of in divorce rates from the early 70s and they're um, lots of single motherhood. And so sometimes I think the desire for sort of like stability and is, is really high. Um, and, and so that's one of my theories, like why people would vote for Trump is because he would stand for something so, tr something that you lost. That's not the best theory. And do you have a good theory? <laughs> I don't know. It's not the best I don't, theory. I mean, I, I, I think that, that uh, actually Ivanka played a role. Uh -huh. I think that she stood in um, as an as a idea of womanhood that female voters could look at and think, well, he think you know he produced her he can't be so terrible and she's a oh my mom says that woman. all the time yeah my mom says that all the time whenever uh -huh. i used to fight with her about trump she is really big in his children uh-huh she'll say like he married these you know he married these women who know how to raise children and even though he didn't do it himself <laughs> like his children are great so that even was hillary said that didn't she when yeah. she was asked to give a compliment <laughs> that she 
rattled around and came up with his children yeah. are fine people, yeah. which by all appearances they are not. Right. Um, <laughs> let it fact check. Um, fact check. But yeah. uh, <laughs> um, what do you uh, make of Ivanka since we're on the oh. subject of the next dynasty? Do you, I feel the next like generation. Um, oddly, f I first encountered in Ivanka. There's a, a great documentary. I think it's called Poor Little Rich Kids. Yeah, or something, something like that. that. Yeah. It's a great documentary. Um, and uh, I think it was the son of the one of the craft, one of the heirs sort of interviewed all his friends who were all heirs and heiresses of certain fortunes. Um, and they were all so sad and beaten down, except Ivanka. Uh -huh. <laughs> she was the one shining exception in that movie. She just has a kind of like a kind of natural innate confidence that's like very hard not to notice. Um, that's just characterological. <laughs> um, in terms of what she stands for, I mean, <laughs> it's a trick, like it's a trick, you know, because on the one hand, um, she, she stands for, she, she has work-life policies, she wrote this book in which she tried to kind of speak the work work-life language in a way which was not relatable <laughs> to anyone who does not have that much money. Um, but um, but, um, but I, I, don't, I don't know how she comes out of this clean. Do you know? I think she would have been better off if, if her dad had not been president. Mm, I think because as time has gone on and she's tried to recede, I think it's, it's gotten harder for her. In the beginning, she just was a symbol, but as the, as the months pass on and he's actually, you know, doing the things that he's doing. I think it's, it's harder for her to uh, d detach herself. I see her sometimes, by the way. She lives in our city. Her children go to the preschool where my children used to go. Really? You see her walk through the zoo with the, you know, trailed by men in, in black suits. And I mean, she has children. They have to leave the house and go somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> she's kind of around in my neighborhood. <laughs> um, heels or flats going through the zoo? She's small. Uh-huh. Yeah, she was wearing high <laughs> We're all small. Boots, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in the last year, uh, you know, your, your ti the title of your book seemed like hyper hyperbole uh, or a kind of a joke, kind of pushing it, kind of an outrageous thing to say, uh, sort of a modest proposal-y kind yeah. of vibe to it. Great title. Um, was it your idea? It was not my idea. Uh, it was, I, I originally wrote this as an article for The Atlantic, which is the magazine that I wrote for uh, most regularly. And my editor came up with that title. Um, and I, you know, it's nerve wracking. Uh, at the time I was also running a women's site and I would notice the statistics and they were kind of alarming. They weren't statistics like women catching up. They were like, you know, things flipping, more female managers, you know, women over 20 make more money in 99% of American regions. Like they felt like they were a little outer spacey. So it's not that I didn't like believe that the idea was underneath there. It's just the title is a little terrifying to actually attach <laughs> yourself to. Um, but you know, I don't, get to, I don't get to choose the covers of the magazine. I, I just write the stories. So he did choose that title. And then when, when I was writing the book, I considered I think it was uh, the person who asked us about hostility putting a question mark at the end of the title, but that's just wimpy. You have to own it or not own it. <laughs> so ultimately I decided that at least that title g g brings an emotional reaction. Um, and it's better to get an emotional reaction than, than a cerebral reaction in some cases, at least as the start of engagement. So I kept the title. Um, so in a way, in the last year, or even maybe less than a year, maybe the last six months, since September, you could almost add an exclamation mark to the title. <laughs> I know. It feels like there are days when you open the newspaper on your iPad or wherever you read the newspaper, and you're actually watching the, what the, the what One used down. to be said and what is still called the patriarchy crumble in front of you. What are you, what do you make? Oh, let's talk about Weinstein. And what do you make of that story happening now, breaking now, people being ready to tell that story and people being ready to hear it? Okay, well, I would actually like some help figuring this out and its relation to my book. So maybe you can help me right here on this stage. <laughs> but one of the things that I think about is, you know, the stories are all about vulnerability, right? They're all about kind of 
uh, this is the debate around, if you just forget my book for a second, the debate that people have around the sexual harassment scandals, not with Weinstein, because he was the gen he was this sort of ogre case, you know, the true demon case, but then there's been a lot of cases underneath that where, where um, you know, the debate is, well, why couldn't you just leave, or why couldn't you just push him away, or why couldn't you just get yourself out of there? It's a sort of a debate about why choose the story which makes you seem the most vulnerable? Like, why is that the story that has the most resonance right now in history? But on the other hand, I often think the only reason that this story gets any traction is almost like a sort of rising expectations French Revolution idea, which is that, that right now men are vulnerable. Like, we have come to a moment where they are toppleable and where there, is an, there are enough tools for women to be able to kind of band together and and kind of make the most. It's almost like it was a tipping point. So even though the, the spirit of the thing is about female vulnerability, the mechanics of the thing is about a moment of female strength, like a moment when people are, you know, do have a power, because Th these stories we all know were unimaginable 30 years ago. Not that the stories were unimaginable, it's unimaginable that they would have this kind of rapid and constant impact. Now part of that is social media, story spread, women are able to get together in numbers, like the Cosby story was the first example of that. It's different when it's one woman than when it's, you know, 25 or 30 or however num many number of women, and social media makes that possible. But I also think partly it's a cultural shift in the, in the power of women and the vulnerability of men. It's also a different thing when it's Gwyneth Paltrow and Angelina Jolie, who are the first women who come out and say this, who are the, among the most powerful women in their field, that it's not the person whose career was ruined right. by the action. So it takes a very powerful, and a celebrity, right. in, a, in a climate where celebrities raised above everything else, right. to be able to have the voice and, and make the statement and be heard. So you think it's a unique case. It's not a cultural matter. It's like a unique case of sort of Harvey Weinstein. Like it has to be a particularly powerful woman or it has to be sort of women who already have power in order to make this happen. I don't know that it does, but I don't think it hurt that it was. Mm -hmm. I mean, had it been um, Rose McGowan alone, or had, it, had she right. been the first voice that we heard? Rose McGowan has a different profile than Gwyneth Paltrow, um, who was Hollywood's mm -hmm. sweetheart. So I think it makes a difference. But uh, but I think I also think you know also female reporters is another part of this story. It's not true in the New Yorker. It was a male reporter. Um, but there have been teams of female reporters at the New York Times, both in the Harvey Weinstein case and on the Fox News cases in Roger Ailes. So I do think that that is that's maybe not a super important part of the story, but it's a part of the story that there are investigative units with female reporters on them who were maybe inspired by stuff that Trump said to pursue, you know, when you have a choice of 10 stories to pursue, you can choose to pursue that story and you have enough power in the newsroom and enough respect. So the woman who broke the Harvey Weinstein story, that team, she was covering gender issues anyway, so that that is a subject that the New York Times cares about because you need an institutions mm -hmm. like the New York Times and the New Yorker to break a story like this. You need, you need the lawyers you need the investigative tools, like like you need a lot of protection uh, journalistically in order to make a story like this you come to life. You need the yeah. time. About you need the time. You know, you need all sorts. Of, you need to get paid while you're spending that time. I mean, you need you need a, a big institution to make a story like this happen. D to what extent do you think that those stories, even being reported out, is a reaction to the election of Trump? I think 100%. Uh -huh. Do you think that? I think so, too. Yeah. I th just in the sense that the Harvey Weinstein story, I'm not like telling a big secret here, been around for five or six years. I mean, I've heard about it. Every like All reporters at some point, hey, you heard about Harvey Weinstein. Like, that story has been around. It sort of made little gossip in the news, but it, it among journalists, that story has been sort of sitting to be picked up. And I think it's something about the Trump women's march on, you know, all that spirit which kind of made that story uh, rise to the top of the, of the news priority list. So those men being actually vulnerable, actually toppleable, even the most powerful men in the industries that we're talking about, that's, those are very different guys than the ones that you uh, wrote somewhat about in your book of uh, who are the, 
these are working class guys who've been uh, run out of, you know, who, who's, whose jobs no longer mm -hmm. exist. Uh, do you, I mean, there's something just vertigo inducing about the recognition that s somebody at the top of their world can be brought down low. Yes. Yes. It's amazing. <laughs> I mean, and it's not, you know, it's the one thing, the only reason I hesitate a tiny, I have two things to say about that. The only reason I hesitate a tiny bit is because, because there are industries that are untouched that right. are very powerful. So media is, is of course going to be the first one to go uh, because we in the media um, value transparency and openness, not because we're awesome. That's just obviously one of our values. That's why you become a reporter. That is not true if you work in a law firm. You do not value. You value confidentiality between you and your clients. So in general, your values are different in different industries. Um, Wall Street, the same thing. You know, they're just not Silicon Valley because it has a libertarian ethos. So there's been sort of, you know, blogs and things that women have written independently in Silicon Valley. So, so there are some powerful industries where you feel. On the other hand, it's spreading. I mean, the Senate, you know, um, there's already been, the, the Senate is no longer untouched in Congress. Uh, so, and, and our president, uh, you know, <laughs> the things he said and did um, regarding women, and, and he's our president. So, so it's, not, it's not complete. Um, but, but just one more thing about that is uh, people in power, sort of power structures and cultural ideas often just don't work together. Um, so, you know, the most famous example of this is Susan Faludi's argument about backlash as women rise in power structures. There's a kind of cultural backlash to that always historically. Um, and I do think, like, there's a way in which this white man toppling from power, a powerful man, is going to actually possibly make things worse because I don't think that the average aggrieved, the aggrieved masculinity people, the sort of average white working class guy or voter who is aggrieved is going to appreciate being put under the umbrella of the powerful white man who have been toppled. It might actually just make things worse. They're very different people with di very different power structures. But because we live in an age of um, identity and not in an age of um, social, like uh, work, like classes in America, they they just g all get put under the umbrella of the patriarchy, which they certainly don't feel like the patriarchy. So. Um. Do you think that they're right in not feeling like the patriarchy? Oh, yeah, they're not the patriarchy. Right. I mean, they really respond to the patriarchy and follow the patriarchy, but um, they're not the patriarchy. I mean, they, they're, 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 like, it's, it's, it's a hard argument to make. There's a sociologist named Michael Kimmelman in NYU who studies um, mass aggrieved masculinity, and the argument he makes kind of cuts it both ways, where he says, you know, working class white men feel entitled to power. And that's incorrect. Nobody is entitled to power. Power switches all the time, historically, always between, not really between men and women, I have to say. Uh, that's, a, that's a historical divide that lasts for century, that lasts for you know, millennia. But, but, but power does switch around in society. So the fact that they feel entitled, they're not entitled to power. Um, uh, but on the other hand, they have, like, in relative terms, lost a lot. Um, so. You said that you uh, you think that there may a backlash may come. Do you have any thoughts about what form it might take? I mean, we've already elected Trump. I know, I know. What could it be more? <laughs> we would have a second term. I mean, that's not that impressive. Like, what else could it be? What else could it be? I have no idea. Peter it's Thiel runs for president. Oh my God! Why did <laughs> you say that? <laughs> Um, I think that you, I don't know, I mean, a lot of it is, I have no thoughts about this at all, and other people do have thoughts, but um, the, th the reason it gets scarier is because, because we're not at a moment where jobs are, 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 you know, the thing that was happening during the 2009 recession, which was happening for economic reasons, is only getting worse because of technology, for technological reasons. So there's just only more jobs that are disappearing. Um, and so, um, um, and, and so I, I don't know what happens. Like, I, somebody's got to figure this out. It's not going to be me, and it's not going to be Trump. So it's some, <laughs> somebody else who actually thinks about these things is, is going to have to figure out sort of, I mean, there's just some recalibration that happens. People have to do something. One um, of the things in your book that you talk about leaving for others to figure out um, is the question of maybe, 
you suggest that we need a new definition of feminism, that younger women are looking at the gener our generation and older and not recognizing themselves in the kind of feminism that we would espouse. Um, do you still think that's the that's still a, a, a direction things are going? I mean, feminism was as notoriously now Miriam Webster's most looked up word this in the last year. So whether that means that what is the people Miriam the Webster most definition of feminism? Miriam, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not actually ah, sure, but I mean, it either means phone. that nobody knows what it is or that everybody's really interested in it and it, or perhaps both. But what do you, what do you <gasps> think of the... Somebody look up the definition for us and tell, <laughs> tell us during the question and answer session. I'm curious what the actual Miriam Webster definition of feminism is if it's just like equal rights for women or how that I actually define yeah look it up All I'm right. actually very well, curious I'll what look they it think up about while it you while I answer while the question answer so the question. Um, that is interesting if I have internet I think people are psychologically unsure whether they, they want to align with the actual term <laughs> um, but uh, but they realize that the term is somehow distantly important and has changed things in the world but are sort of personally uncomfortable with it I mean part of this is natural generational things if you uh, do you guys know the comedian Aziz Ansari who was called out by a woman who went on a date with him recently in a magazine called babe.net in which she described in sort of exquisite detail uh, the nature of their date and his particular moves um, well if you read babe.net which is which is the the mo you know a very sort of recent iteration of of women's site or fem feminist thinking i guess it is not really recognizable to me as a, as a, as what i understand to be feminist like a lot of it is is what i understand to be misogynist in my sort of generic <laughs> feminist upbringing <laughs> about sort of what women should do and how they should behave and how to please your man kind of stuff. Um, and a lot of it is sort of angry, radical, feministy stuff. So it's very hard to kind of find the boundaries. Okay, go ahead. I have found it. The definition of fe feminism, according to Merriam-Webster, is one, the theory of the political, economic, and social equality of the sexes, or two, organized activity on behalf of women's rights and interests. That's so generic. Yeah. yeah, that's a dictionary. Um, Organized so activity on behalf of women. And Who could the object to and that? A theory, yeah. That seems <laughs> and completely a theory, unobjectionable. And a theory of equality. Well, yes, but isn't that the argument that we'd be making for to, to women who say, well, I'm not a feminist because I don't, you know, hate men or whatever it is that, that well I hate men I'm <laughs> just kidding um, <laughs> no but what I don't but I with have two sons I, I do <laughs> have two sons I love them very much yes with, with this um, this r kind of re reshaping of feminism into something you don't recognize yeah um, what are the risks attendant thereon well, don't you, this is the moment I bet when people are more likely to ally with feminism. Like we haven't heard one of those celebrities, I'm not a feminist lately, yeah. because it feels like a moment when feminism and feminist instincts and even at some level organized activity has led to something beautiful and good. Like has really like, like sort of aired like really sort of dirty secrets about how things were operating and how movies were made and how people were getting hurt. Like it does feel like incontrovertibly things have been aired and exposed um, that, that should have been aired and exposed. That's the first wave of, of the sexual harassment thing. Um, now as time goes on, I think the younger women have less ambivalence and, and the older women have more ambivalence <laughs> about whether they want to sign on uh -huh. to what is defined as feminism. Uh, and I think a lot of this definition, since you have a Didion room here, was beautifully, uh, beautifully articulated by Joan Didion in an article she wrote in 1972 called The Women's Movement about, it it's a very funny and, and bitter, and I'm uh, not bitter, but sort of um, biting uh, essay, but it's essentially about uh, why the women's movement persistently uh, uh, raises the specter of women as vulnerable um, and her objection to that. Um, and I think as older women sort of feel more confident, they, they object to that sort of cycle. Uh, the thing that I read under the new feminism is a kind of rage. Um, and I don't know what the rage is about. It's sort of a rage against dating mores, a rage against 
sort of promises unkept. Like there really does feel to me like there's an anger under all of this vulnerability and this description of dating and this sort of like who sold me this bill of goods about where women are, which is real. Um, which is very real, and I sort of, you know, I, I don't 100% understand it, uh, although I do ask women, younger women, to explain it to me a lot. Your book had, when it was published, and, and still does when one reads it now, a kind of very optimistic tone. It was not the title is the end of men, but the subtitle is in some ways yeah. more what the book is is concerned with and it's and you see as something to celebrate the empowerment in so many different spheres of women what um do you s do you feel as optimistic as the as that or have you no i think that the spirit of five years ago which is the time that i wrote this book is very different than the spirit of right now um in this for example i have a chapter on the hookup culture um and it's a chapter about how not that women were feeling optimistic but th that essentially women were kind of actively um, propagating the hookup culture because that's a time of life when they did not want commitments. That this idea that it was always men avoiding commitments was a kind of superficial complaint level. But if you actually got down deeper, you found that women were avoiding commitments, especially at that particular age, the college age. There was one woman who I think said to me, said to the researchers, I quote, you know, um, well, having a, having a real boyfriend is the equivalent of having a four credit class, and I just don't have time for that. <laughs> like that was the thinking of women about relationships back then, because they were really at their most kind of, and this is sort of pre-children, they're at their most ambitious and um, their most successful. Uh, and, and, and I feel like that chapter, I would never write that mm -hmm. way again, because there's just been so much anger about Title IX and sexual harassment on campus that, it, that it, ju it, it just feels wrong tonally. It feels so clearly like you're missing something about why people are so angry about what's going on. Um, um, with that, I am going to invite um, questions hostile or otherwise from the audience. So, d d sir. Speak. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to ask you to try to keep it brief. And m people can't hear you. I'm going to have to repeat it. So, um, so try to keep it brief and a question, if you don't mind. So now there's a degree. So empowerment, forgiveness, sh should women who are now newly empowered feel forgiveness or, uh, or, or vindictiveness in I feel that question is a setup. <laughs> <laughs> There's only one right answer. Um, you can't say vindictiveness. No, I feel that that's um, a Christian way of looking at it, by which I mean, you know, broadly Christian. Um, to me, what I think about is not what happens in the individual moment, because I think the reality is that those men are going to be sacrifices to a larger cause. Um, what would it mean for someone to forgive Charlie Rose? He's not necessarily, people are going to view him in the way that they're going to view him. To me, the m important question is sort of, you know, 10, 15 years down the road, what comes out of all this? Like, what actually changes? Do we actually get a change in intimate relations between one man and one woman in a, in a bedroom or on a like that's that's actually my real question. So when my children, grandchildren, etc., like are actually in the room. So the Aziz Ansari article, like I agree, that was a that was a that was a hostile thing to publish every single move that he made in that way. That it has a feel of kind of trying to humiliate him. Is that a good thing? You know, maybe not for a news article. But do, am I glad it was published? Yes. I am glad it was published. I am glad that men and women read that article, like are forced to face this kind of core failure of communication between men and women who are on a date and think about that. And, and, it, and if all goes well, like the future such dates will not go exactly like that. Yes. Uh, you have boys. I don't know if you have a daughter. I do, one and two.
both. Yeah. Yeah. I don't a question about yeah. co-education, co co education, good or bad? I, I don't have a broad, like a kind of global opinion. I think it just depends on the child. I really, I don't. I mean, there's there's lots of evidence that boy, you know, I have a chapter on education, and there's lots of evidence about how the speed up of education isn't great for boys. Um, so so there are some boys who just can't handle it for some reason. Um, but um, so I I think it's great as an option for the children who you know can't handle it. The lady in the middle in the beautiful fuchsia sweater. I, I think about this all this the time. This is the question. If Hillary had been elected, would Harvey Weinstein have fallen? Essentially. I think no. I think from inside journalism, no. No. I don't think, because they just, it would have been a different era and they would not have prioritized. It's, you guys have no idea what it is like to publish a story like that. Like, you have no idea how hard it is to get people on the record, to get your lawyers to back you up, to fight his lawyers. People have been trying to report the Harvey Weinstein story for, you know, as I said, many, many years. And you have to really, really convince your editors and your institution that this is a story of maximum importance and high priority to push that one through because it is really damn expensive and will take a lot of your time and a lot of your lawyers' time. So I think no. You know? Lady at the back in the gray. The question is, what about dating co-workers in the current climate? That used to be how we met our spouses, and now young women are terrified to date anyone they work with. Feelings? Probably thoughts. young men who are terrified <laughs> to date anyone <laughs> they work with. That's the warning I give to my sons. Um, you know, I have switched my opinion on this. You know, I used to think, okay, but it doesn't this kind of put a weird, the NPR, which is where I work now, went through a moment like this, um, uh, where certain people were fired for in this, in this uh, harassment thing. And I, I, whether it was in my mind, I did feel like I noticed that the men in the elevator in the days after would like <laughs> stay as far away <laughs> from the women as humanly possible. But but then I thought like, well, okay, what like why is why is sort of flirting and dating in the work? Do you really want to die on that sword? Like, is it so important to to kind of you know flirt and and meet your person on the in the work? But it doesn't seem like a hugely important thing, especially now that people date online and that there are avenues, like I've heard of things where like, let's say a superior and inferior, like they kind of have strong feelings for each other and you can clear it with the right people. I feel like it, it's, I used to think it was a big problem and now I think like, it's not a big problem. <laughs> the, the, the race will go on. The race will go on, um, exactly. Uh, I want you to end just talking a little bit. You're, you're um, a mother of sons, I'm a mother of sons. What do we tell our boys? Oh my God. Um, I genuinely worry about this. Like, I, I, I know we have this image in our heads of, like, the jocks and they're the one, you know, the frat boys doing the harassment. I actually think that a lot of times it's boys who don't, who are not that great at reading social cues, of which I have one. And that's, those are the boys I actually worry about, who are just like, they're just not that, I have both kinds, one who's like excellent at the social cues and one who's not. And I, I really do worry of that, that he's gonna be in a moment and just kind of not read the moment correctly and get himself in big trouble. Now I've also, here's, uh, let me try this one on you. So I said this to a friend of mine, um, who's, who's a great writer on a lot of these subjects, and what she said was, look, she has two sons too, so she says, um, in sex, for millennia, women have carried all of the risks. That's just been true forever. Um, so even though she has two sons, she says, I talk to them and I'm scared of it, but I'm okay with the fact that now men have to carry some of the risks in sex. It sort of divides a little more evenly, and so I can live with that. That way, I thought that was an interesting position. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I think she's 
she's probably right in sex and in everything else yeah um, the the uh the kind of the the carrying of the of the burden is being redistributed yeah and it always feels unfair yeah to everybody who's carrying it yeah um and now the men are feeling the a little bit of the unfairness that women have felt for a long time right exactly exactly and on that i think we will end so thank you very thank very you much all. for being here